Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to the third in the series on constructive conversations. Uh, this session is inclusive. Just as you saw, um, this session is being recorded, and it's for those people who cannot join us, and for those people who loved it so much, you guys want to watch it back. So this um, will be put up on the Engineers Without Borders website. So for an introduction, my name is Georgia Thompson, and I am a member hosting this session. Um, I'm the first member to host the session, but going forward, Engineers Without Borders would love for other members to get involved and host sessions just like I am today. So I currently work for Bamnatal. However, I am on to convent to Tony G and Partners for the next few months. My background is mostly in infrastructure projects based in the UK. I love everything inclusion and co-founded a social enterprise called Diversity, which focuses on the inclusion of people from diverse groups. Um, yeah, focus on inclusion while I'm there. So that's about me. So I'd love to know who we've got with us today. So if you could please give me your name um, and where you are in the world. You get extra brownie points if you can add a phonetic flair to it. So for example, my name's Georgia and I'm excited in Isha. So if you just be able to just put your name, where you're from in the chat, and if you could do a little feeling and in there as well, it'll be, it'll be great. Question of who you want to be first. Everybody. <laughs> Peter Bentall, retired, as you would probably gather. Um, Worked most of my life in Africa, now living in Basingstoke. Okay, amazing. Excited um, about the fact that my grandson has just started a civil engineering course at Leeds University. Oh, lovely. Lovely. Thank you for sharing. Um, we've got Luke feeling lucky in London. Uh, Charlotte listening from London. Um, Millie in Shoreditch. Um, be great for other people to pop in the chat and yeah it'd be lovely to see where you guys are from so while you're busy doing that um we're just gonna share the presentation about what today is about so the engineers about borders 2021 to 2030 strategy sets out four key principles for globally responsible engineering that we want to adopt by individuals and organizations across the industry so the first one is responsible to meet the needs of everyone within the limits of our planet. It should be at the heart of engineering. We also have purposeful to consider all the influence impacts um, of engineering from a project to a product's inception to the end of its life. This should be at global and local scale with people and planet. So we've already had those two sessions already and they are on the engineers that board website if you would like to watch it back. Inclusive, which is today's session. And this is to ensure that viewpoints and knowledge are heard, included, respected in the engineering process. Regenerative, to actively restore and regenerate ecological systems rather than reducing impact. So today we're going to have a panel. And just before we get onto the panel, I just wanted to pose some questions for everybody to think about. Um, really wanna get everybody involved. So I want some questions coming through in the chat. But just to get you thinking, um, I've just prepared a short introduction. So when I decided to be an engineer, I wanted to make people's lives better, um, not necessarily just line pockets of shareholders, but is it ever that simple? In engineering, do we follow our instincts or do we follow our leaders? Do we follow the engineering or do we follow the money? Daily, we all make decisions affecting people's livelihood, access to employment and education. However, that doesn't always cross your mind when you're just thinking about technical aspects of how to offset a beam. Engineering is more than just technical principles. It's the wider picture. It is sustainability. It is professional commitment and integrity. So when we look at incidents like Grenfell Tower, do we consider a reasonable budget in the first instance? Is it reasonable to expect companies to cut corners but not costs? When building major infrastructure, who makes those decisions and based on what? When redeveloping an area, who is involved in the process? Is it who has the biggest voice, the most money, who will, or who will actually use the space? 
we think bigger as in internationally when deciding which markets to enter, do we do this solely on profits? Our engineering skills are an international export, sometimes designing and building for communities we've only ex ever experienced on holiday at best. And when designing anything, how often do we consider the end user? Everything is created twice or in an engineer's life three times, once in the mind, once in a drawing, and then in real life. How can we ensure that every step of the process is inclusive, ethical, and profitable? Can it ever be all free? I am sure there's a way that we can settle our profit margins and our consciousness. So to discuss all of these in different aspects from different sides, we have an amazing and inspired panel ready to go. We're gonna pose questions to the panel and we're gonna discuss what it means to be inclusive. So on the screen now, it's just some examples of what actions you can take to encourage um, to be inclusive in the engineering process. So once we've heard from the panel and you know, you've got a few questions going in your mind, we're going to have self-facilitated breakout rooms to discuss this in further detail. And then we're going to come um, back to wrap up. So as we go through this process, I want you guys to be thinking what it means to be inclusive to yourselves, what it means inclusion means, um, you know, within our space and how we can ensure diverse viewpoints and knowledge are included and respected in the engineering process. So let me introduce our panel. Firstly, I'd love to introduce Simon. So Simon is an enabler at Makers Valley based in South Africa. Um, he's working on enabling a well-being community econ economy in Makers Valley in Johannesburg. He advocates for prioritizing people and planet for profit and enables social enterprises to further these aims. He's currently testing the idea through an interdisciplinary PhD at Wits University. Um, Simon's done many different, different roles um, within housing and a lot of non-profit and um, non-paid roles as well. So we next have Sam. So Sam is a transport systems engineer um, at Energy Systems Catapult, working on transport decarbonisation projects for net zero. She is a member of the INCOS UK Engineering Systems Working Group and part of the operations team for Sheffield Women in Technology, a grassroots organisation dedicated to spotlighting emerging female technology professionals in the north of England. And last but not least, we have Isabella. Isabella is a Vice President of Grassroots Education at Electra Components. Isabella's team manages the global education outreach program and the internship across the Electra Components group of brands. Um, she's a productive professional rebel and has a, built a successful career in developing young people from diverse backgrounds and encouraging them to reach their potential and achieve their ambitions. Through her role, she's able to do this for events, competitions, and initiatives all over the world to improve their employability skills and career prospects. So to come to Isabella first, please could you tell us a little bit about um, your work and how you support students in the transition from university and the working world? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Georgia. Um, very nice to be here today with everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, so we, uh, I personally have a background in one of the world's largest professional engineering institutions. So I spent uh, 11 years of my career working for them. Um, and they did a bunch of extensive research over the last eight years with um, lots of different engineering employers. Uh, and what that research has fed back year on year um, is that there are two really big gaps in graduate engineers' skills. Um, and those are technical skills, the application of, so they're fantastic with the theory, but the actual application of those in a real world working environment, a little bit lacking. Um, and the other is soft skills. So those uh, really critical employability skills that help them to flourish in the workplace. So uh, I'm very proud to run a program over here. Um, RS, uh, which is the, the biggest brand that Electro Components um, is the parent company of. We're lucky in that we have, gosh, about 500,000 electronic and industrial products in our range. Um, and so we have a bunch of really cool products that young engineers can actually use and practice their technical skills with. 
We also run competitions, um, content creation on technical topics to enable students to hone their technical writing skills. Um, and we support young engineers with delivering local STEM outreach uh, to schools. Uh, we offer volunteering opportunities and awards programs to help them with recognition and putting things on their CVs. Um, and most importantly, the soft skills training. So we have a, a portfolio of 14 topics that we upskill young engineers in. Um, and then we have some learning events as well, um, including some events that are very specifically uh, focused on certain areas of diversity and inclusion. So that's the kind of full, full offering that we have from our team. Why do you think it's important that we do have specific um, programmes for diversity and inclusion? I think for me, I, I believe it's a it's a role model thing. Um, you know, we all know that that saying of you can see it, you can be it. Um, and if young people can't see people in engineering that look like them or that they resonate with, it perpetuates that cycle of them not not going into into that career. Um, so, yeah, I think it's showcasing those role models and their achievements is really, really important for young people from diverse backgrounds to know that there's a place for them um, in this career. I think mean, that, that's really actually quite powerful and just have a, that notion that they belong, which, you know, makes the allows their voices to be heard um, and feel like, you know, they can take up space. Um, yeah. Thank you, Isabella. And, you know, just a reminder to everybody, put some questions in the chat. Um, so while you're kind of thinking of maybe some questions you can ask Isabella, I'm just going to pop over to Sam. Um, so Sam, you've been involved with uh, Engineers at Borders for a long time. Um, it'll be really interesting for, I think, you know, everyone to kind of understand how you embed inclusion into the work that you do now that you're in the workplace. Sure. Um, so when I started at university, I, I got involved with a branch um, and became the first female president of that branch. And Working, working with Engineers at Borders UK whilst I was a student uh, exposed me to things like working in a multidisciplinary environment and working with different kinds of people, which is something that at the time when I was doing my degree wasn't necessarily emphasised. So that's some, that was kind of like a key learning um, aspect of being a part of Engineers at Borders when I was a student, as, I, as I'm sure is the same with a number of people who are on the call as well. Um, for me, um, Understanding inclusivity and the notion of needing to factor in people from different disciplines and what their needs are and requirements are when you are considering the design and development of any type of engineering project. Um, for me, that was a natural precursor to developing systems engineering, thinking as uh, systems thinking as a skill, um, which I didn't quite realise and appreciate that I had developed until I went into industry and found that I was relying on it increasingly more as it became more and more important in certain industries that I was working in where the practice of systems engineering is still quite immature and is still quite considered novel discipline. I started out life as an electrical and electronic engineer and um, working with Engineers Without Borders also gave me the opportunity to explore other interests and inspired me to do my uh, MSc in renewables, which I may not have ordinarily considered had I just been purely focused on my degree at the time. Um, and doing my MSc in renewables did open up um, a number of opportunities to work in, in other industries that I hadn't necessarily originally would have considered for my career and naturally led me towards working in both oil and gas so on, on the energy generation side and then in transportation specifically in the rail industry which has now led to me working in research and innovation for transport decarbonisation. Um, a key example that I'd quite like to share of, in, of inclusivity in practice in industry and in particular actually is um, I was working for a business uh, during the pandemic and um, because of the wider situation, there was um, a very keen drive to, in, to implement an equality, diversity and inclusion strategy within that particular organisation. Um, unfortunately, with the, unfortunately, as the consultation for this strategy did not include the engineers within the, the, the organisation, what ultimately ended up happening was I ended up in a performance review where a very senior member of staff was asked me the question, what am I currently doing to improve equality, diversity and inclusion within the business? Um, so obviously this was a, um, a very interesting situation to be in um, and I, I felt empowered because I, I know and understand how, you know, the power of inclusivity and seeing how well projects work when inclusivity is, in, is considered. Um, I, I felt empowered to give the feedback that you should have considered um, 
all employees within the organisation when developing the strategy, then you would have perhaps had a much more two-way understanding of, for example, the activities that I'm already engaged in that support the business. And yeah, it, yeah. so um, so that was an interesting experience. That, uh, that's probably an, op- an opposite answer to the question that you've asked. In that, no, I think I think it's quite interesting because I think when we think about inclusivity, it can have a uh, like complete focus on necessarily like people entering the industry or getting diverse talent in, but sometimes it doesn't always consider actually working relationships and how we work with each other within yeah. um, the industry. So I think it's that's a in culture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So I felt very empowered to give that feedback and I actually sort out my colleagues, you know, uh, and uh, empowered them to give the same feedback as well. And so then actually got fed up and some amendments were were made, which was, again, a, a positive thing, I think. So ultimately. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you for sharing. That's a really good example. Um, and just to move on to Simon and also remember, put your questions in the chat. Um, but yeah, Simon, so you do work connecting developers with um, communities and social entrepreneurs um, who have really vibrant ideas. Could you tell us a little bit more about this and, and why it's so important? Sure. So um, first, I, I wanted to just sort of take a step back from that and why it's so important and kind of look at um, what often happens Uh, where developments happen in areas that are in need of regeneration or where have been prioritized by local councils or national governments um, because they are struggling with um, the upkeep of services or deterioration of the built environment, et cetera. Um, So that's the kind of area that that I'm working in. It's in inner city Johannesburg and it's um, been difficult for local government to, um, for a variety of reasons for a number of years. Um, And they, the kind of poster child developer um, bought up a bunch of properties um, that were kind of Victorian, which is relatively old for Johannesburg and um, redid them into studios for, which are kind of artisanal studios. Um, I think Somerset, is it Somerset House? Mm. Um, in London is um, something similar. Um, And a lot of these developments can be extremely exclusionary. And um, because of crime in Johannesburg, this one has massive walls around it and security guards. And this is the nature of how to deal with things like crime. But what we have been trying to do since 2018, which was just after the development started, was seeing how the development could actually be an asset to the existing residents. And um, given that the development was going ahead and there was no way to kind of legally stop it, even if that was seen to be the better thing, we weren't sure, but but there was no way to stop it. So how could we turn the development as much as possible towards the existing residents and stakeholders in the neighborhood? Um, Why this is important is because the biggest issue with uh, exclusion really or reason behind exclusion most often is inequalities of variety of kinds. So wealth inequalities, um, inequality of socioeconomic background, education, inequality of um, housing and spatial inequalities of where people can afford to live or can afford to get to and access. And so when you do see um, a development that will likely bring people with a lot of money to spend, um, quite often that inequality still remains where you have a very small enclave where there's a lot of money uh, being spent and attracting people with the spending power, but that doesn't actually benefit the surrounding area at all. So we were trying to use it as a way to reduce inequalities through inclusionary projects. And the big question we're asking really is of, um, of wealthier people um, why are you actually doing this? Why are you, why are you going ahead with this, this, this development? Is it purely for profit? Um, so when meeting with the shareholders and with the partners behind the development, is it purely for, for, for financial profit? Or is there a deeper reason to this? Do you actually want to feel better about yourself um, knowing that the development is actually benefiting people more than, your, than just yourselves? So that's how we kind of... Um, came about with the wellbeing economy. And I mean, we've wellbeing economy alliance is actually quite big in the UK. Um, we all, and Scotland is one of the, we 
well-being economy governments. Um, but uh, the well-being economy essentially says um, put people and planet before profit um, mm -hmm. and looking beyond profit towards actually greater well-being for both the wealthy and the poor. And I think through getting people to rethink the reason for the development and also um, the activities that are then allowed and how inclusion can happen, we, we have been relatively successful compared to other developments which by nature just become exclusionary. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you. I think just um, to kind of sum all the, the three of our panelists up, we've kind of got the people entering the industry um, with Isabella supporting them, empowering them, and hopefully steering them into leadership positions eventually so we can start to look at what it means to be inclusive. We have Sam who is being inclusive through the work that she does um, and, you know, enabling people and businesses to kind of adopt that kind of approach through the work that she does and her own influence and then we've got Simon who is connecting organizations and individuals or small businesses um, and empowering them to challenge them um, about the reasons why they are doing what they're doing and to make sure that it is more sustainable. So um, I just want to ask uh, quite a big question but I'm going to go to Isabella first is through the work that you do um, and this being the decade of action, how and why do you see inclusivity being key to achieving the U United Nations Sustainability Development Goals? Yeah, I think Simon just touched on some of that really nicely, actually. Um, you know, when you look at, at the SDGs, actually, how are we going to achieve some of those if we don't have inclusive engineers looking at those? Um, so, for example, you know, gender equality, um, we, we know there's a huge imbalance of women in, in the engineering industry. Um, and so we need to be actively addressing those skills, that, those gaps in that talent that can design products that help other women, um, as, a, as an example. Uh, so I think engineering sits behind a lot of the UN SDGs and can help to solve or bring about solutions to many of those challenges. Um, but you can't, as Sam said, design products for certain groups of people if you haven't got representatives of those groups designing the products because they know what works for, for them. Um, there are many examples where that hasn't panned out particularly well. So, I mean, I'm sure um, everyone probably remembers, was it last year, the, um, the the NASA trip that was planned with the female astronauts and none of the suits fitted the female astronauts because there were no females that helped to design those suits. Um, so there are examples like that in bounds um, that we really need to look to and, and do better. Uh, but I think those... Um, those kind of gaps in, in diverse people in engineering um, are, are becoming more and more apparent and hopefully are, are starting to be fixed. Yeah, so, I, think, I, <laughs> I think so too, they're coming to the forefront. Um, yeah, so a similar question to you, Sam, but I guess again, in the way that you do your work and maybe through, yeah, I'd like, yeah. Sure. <laughs> Picking up from sort of Isabella's point about obviously gender being obviously a key element of the SDGs, um, in terms of sort of in terms of sort of uh, gender specifically, it's also about socioeconomic groupings, and inevitably, so you know we have a certain, let me put it this way, certain socioeconomic distribution uh, within within our country, for example, and a key parameter that I'm I, I routinely work with in terms of inclusive within the inclusivity sort of narrative with Sheffield women in technology is the is about is accessibility so it's looking at what isn't currently what what things are wanted by the community or would like to be had by the community first of all so obviously it's important to understand what a community needs and what they want um but also understanding why isn't it currently accessible why is it how do we make and then and then figuring out how do we make this more accessible. A really simple example that I can share is, and I appreciate it may sound small, but um, we ran a, um, so we had a lot of feedback from our community stating that there was a lot of interest in the area of agile working and agile principles, such as Scrum, for example, but most of the courses are at the time were current that were currently available were only really available for people already practicing within certain systems engineering communities. So they weren't very, 
accessible and they were kind of four four day long courses and weren't quite compatible with kind of the, the schedules of the type of the community that we represent. And so we decided to pull together a simple introductory event called You Are More Agile Than You Think to build on the clear, the existing knowledge and interest of the community. Um, and we managed to persuade somebody to voluntarily come in and give an introductory lecture on the topic. And we set, we set and as, again, as simple as it sounds, we set the um, event to be freely accessible on all platforms. Again, certain, certain training events are the way they're advertised and where they're advertised also influences who can and can't attend them. Um, and uh, we set it at a time and a date that we knew was accessible to that particular to this particular community. Mm -hmm. And we received really great feedback. Um, as this was a technical training course, they can put that on their CV. We as an organisation are gaining um, a lot of recognition from businesses and we've also been recognised by the WISE campaign. So we have, so having that training um, workshop on their CV has proactively contributed to a number of community members' career progression within the areas that they'd like to go into within the technology area. I don't know if many people actually know this, but Sheffield has got quite a big emerging tech industry, um, um, for those who don't know. Um, and it's about making sure that um, the not just me, but the other operations team members, we all come from the, the big major traditional industries, so to speak, oil and gas, rail. Um, one of my one of my teammates is from the military as well. And so right. between us, we're sort of are taking the lessons that we've learned from these big industries and we're trying to sort of plow them into the fact that this is an emerging industry. What can you learn from the industries that have gone before us to ensure that? we're not experiencing the kind of problems that say, for example, I, the lack, the, the kind of inclusivity issues that say, for example, I discussed in my earlier um, point uh, in the previous question. Yeah, so, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of sort of how, how do we go, how do we, you know, uh, create something that's accessible? I'd say that um, if I could just sort of lead back to a much wider point, and that is um, kind of compassion and empathy and listening. And I think this was touched on by a previous panelist in one of the previous um sessions um these these three these three things have i think previously been typically consigned to just being personality traits when actually i think they're becoming increasingly critical leadership skills if we want to be able to try and be in as inclusive as possible especially on the road to the sdgs so yeah i think that's something similar to what Isabella was saying earlier um about those soft skills and you know equipping people with those um we've got a question for, for simon i guess on your earlier point about um in one also about what sam said about empathy but how do you find um it's more from your experience you know how much do you find developers are honest about their profit focus do we need stronger incentives to get them to rethink that's the question from philippa jeffries Mm. Um, yeah, I think there's growing pressure on developers to have, I mean, that has since the Brundtland report in 1987 been that focus on the triple bottom line, so, um, focus on social and environment as well as profit. I think what is changing now is, um, is that there's a reconsideration now to actually look beyond profit and to deprioritize profit entirely and that's that's a little more difficult to enforce so you do get developers that obviously push a corporate social responsibility line and co-opt various um, uh, fashionable phrases around sustainability or resilience or social justice even um, and I think that that is um, quite easy to 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 um, pretend about, I guess, to, to put together in um, as part of the annual report in the social responsibility pages. But mm -hmm. I think what, where it really comes down to is the numbers um, and, and also sometimes the awards where, where developers are interested in winning awards or other prestigious things. And that is part of what fuels their own drive. Um, you do get so for instance victoria yards won um the uli which is the urban land institute award last year i think um and and that was uh, a big thing for them and it was because of the work that that we were doing as makers valley partnership and i think that that sort of those sorts of awards are useful but they don't have the teeth that um are going to force every uh development to be more socially and environmentally responsive and deprioritize profit. Um, 
And uh, for that, it really comes down to uh, different ways of, of managing it through planning regulations and through planning approvals. And I think in places like the UK, uh, less, less so in South Africa, but in places like the UK, um, those are important hurdles and also well-governed hurdles. Um, and that, um, that there are uh, consequences if, if people do, if developers do not follow um, or if property uh, managers also do not follow the legislation that is set out for them or the bylaws that are set out for them. So I think um, not trusting the standard uh, property developer or manager to, to prioritize social and ecological well-being, but, um, but putting it into legislation as much as possible, whether it be through environmental impact assessments or social impact assessments, um, or whether it be through the change in zoning, um, if, if, there's need, if there needs to be changes in zoning, then they have to run through those approval processes, but put to legislate it, unfortunately, and to make sure that, although it feels frustrating, that government does remain strong enough to be able to enforce that. And in many places, government is weakening, both at local and national level. And I think, I'm not sure, but I say in the UK in some ways as well, and really making sure that that doesn't continue to happen, that we still have a government that, that is able to enforce the, the rules that benefit us all. Yeah, I think just on the top, on the back of that, um, Sam, I think it would be quite interesting to know for your innovative route and the research that you do, um, how that challenges current standards and current kind of policies. How does that process happen and how are people's voices heard um, and respected during that process? Uh, that's a big question. Um... I, so the, I work for Catapult and they are essentially not-for-profit centres of excellence. Any money that we do make from what we output, we plough straight back into our organisational activities, especially our research. Um, in terms of the routes and, and the pathways, how, how we get from engineering to policy and how we, we influence in that way, um, I, I think, I mean, I think it's a very stereotypical phrase, but it is about disruptive innovation um, and it is about thinking sideways and it is about producing research and findings that go against the grain or don't necessarily sit within the current narrative of what we're discussing with regards to net zero, for example. Um, transport is actually, again, I don't, uh, just to address any and all knowledge levels in the room, transport is actually, the transport sector is actually a major contributor to the greenhouse gas emissions in the UK. So it's, in, it's quite quickly emerging as kind of a, a very important area to be addressing and if, if we want to reach our net zero goals. Um, the irony is, is that when you look at most of the average literature on net zero and regarding decarbonisation and so, so forth, Transport it occupies surprisingly little space um, and is in, in many ways tends to be glossed over. So at the minute, it's very much about being quite a strong presence and making sure that you're there in those conversations. Um, and that's part, partly why I'm part of an energy systems working group and not a transport systems working group. Um, and making sure that the, the findings of our work are being represented in those meetings, in those conversations. Um, it may, again, it may, it may sound very simple, but um, being that, per, that person in the room who kind of challenges and says, actually, there's something, yet, there's something we, that we've missed here. Obviously, in terms of inclusivity, we're very quick to think about the people, but it's also important to think about the knowledge that those people carry and what, and what they can contribute in, term of com, in terms of competencies. And I think that without moving towards too much of a meritocracy argument, you know, taking the time to understand what people know and what they can contribute is in itself, uh, you know, the first step to being able to being more inclusive because you know who you can reach out to if you do need advice on something or need that input into a project or 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 an effort or some or net zero. So, yeah, I think that's a really um, important point that you talked about, about competency. And I guess in terms of you know an engineer and engineering council, it comes to certain attributes. I was wondering from Isabella's point of view, in terms of like balancing that business need, um, the qualities and attributes of um, the engineers entering the industry, have you noticed any like gaps? I think you mentioned it earlier, but do you think that is something that should be addressed at university or is it something that you learn on the job? Um, what, are your, what are your thoughts on, on it? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And um, I'm really glad that Sam pointed out earlier, there's certain soft skills that 
are increasingly becoming key leadership qualities. Um, so, you know, over the last sort of year and a half in particular with what the world has gone through, um, I think we've seen that emotional intelligence has climbed to be the top number one leadership skill that is required. No one teaches that stuff in university, which is why programmes like ours have to exist, right? Because we know that there's that gap. Um, but who's going to teach the young people these things if they're not getting it in educational institutions? Um, so, yeah, I, I think that, that it would be really interesting if um, there was a module introduced, you know, perhaps in not just in engineering, but this is, I would imagine, a skills gap in a lot of industries that, that young people then go on into. Um, and I personally believe that the um, the curriculum is a little bit outdated and, and probably should be updated now to include some of these things that we now recognise as being key elements that young people need um, and indeed other people at, at stages, differing stages of their career. In fact, if I might just end on a cheesy note, um, so we actually in our programme, we don't call it soft skills because I have a personal bugbear with the fact that it's called soft. Um, it makes it sound like it's less important than all of those other skills that you learn. So we call it super skills. Um, and we're on, we're on a personal crusade to start a bit of a movement um, to change that name from soft skills to super skills, because actually they are the thing that can enable you to be the very best in the workplace and to have people leading you that show those skills. So when we talk about inclusion and leadership, what does inclusive leadership look like to you? Or when you when you see that word, what, what do you um, how, what do you associate with inclusive leadership? Who me again? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, so again, I think it's been touched on already. I think actually um, listening, um, authenticity, vulnerability admitting that we don't know everything um, and that we need to hear other people's perspectives and lived experiences. Uh, I think those are really, really important things that we as leaders can do to make people feel included, valued, heard. Um, and some of those things are often seen as uh, weaknesses, you know, to, to say, I don't know that. No one knows everything. There's nothing wrong with saying that. Um, and, and it enables someone to have a voice to share their experience with you. And that in itself can be a very powerful act to make other people feel that they're heard. And just a follow up question for that. Do you have any examples of how you or someone else has made somebody feel um, included, um, valued and respected and, and seen? Yeah, so um, I actually, um, so I noticed that Simon popped something in the chat there about Black Lives Matter. Um, so uh, yeah, I personally, I'm, I'm married to a Jamaican man. I have two mixed race uh, children. Um, and last year when the George Floyd murder happened, um, obviously we were all quite incensed as so many people around the world were. Um, and it became really apparent to me that, you know, we needed to make a space for our, our colleagues to be able to talk about these things. Um, so I'm really lucky because I work for an amazing organisation that enables people to have these difficult conversations. So we actually started at that point um, a race inclusion employee resource group, uh, which I head up with another colleague of mine. Um, and within a very short space of time, we had hosted roundtable discussions. Um, we've set some very ambitious targets around um, ethnically diverse leadership and, uh, and throughout the levels of the organisation. Um, and again, those activities, we, we had hundreds of colleagues that took part in those roundtable discussions and not just colleagues of colour. This were also, you know, their white allies. Um, and it's, it's really important even just having those conversations um, for people to learn and understand more about each other and, and foster that um, sense of belonging again, that you, you can talk and you can say these things. Um, but yeah, we didn't actually do any of the talking. We as, a, as an Embrace um, employee resource group, we hosted them. We did what you're doing, Georgia. We dropped some questions in and the key point was listening. Um, so it sounds like a really simple thing, but it's really, really powerful and valuable. I think, thank you. Go on, Simon, I was coming to you. No, I, I was going to ask if I can speak from a South African perspective, if you're yeah. still on this topic. Oh, okay. 
Um, I think just just to add on to um, to what Isabel was saying, um, we had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the TRC hearings, which were very very large nationwide versions um, of of what it seems um, like you were hosting, and I think they were very valuable. Um, that was just after the so-called end of apartheid, um, and they were very valuable for allowing people to start that process. But really, I don't think that leadership is inclusive unless it is truly inclusive, unless you do have representation from the range of people that make up a specific area or a specific country or what a specific business in that, that is servicing a certain group of people or whatever it is. But look at that diversity that uh, your users or your employees or your um, whatever <laughs> um, citizens and and the leadership needs to represent that and unless that is actually um, again unless uh, for instance in South Africa we have a firm, affirmative action um, and it's a very slow process but it does actually lead to transformation and that that has to be in place because otherwise we will continue having uh, uprisings that are racially fueled or people that no matter what the talk is, it's, it doesn't matter. The, the, the change needs to come both economically in terms of the wealth gap and the income gap and also the leadership gap and people that, um, that are in decision-making power at the moment need to actually step aside. Mm -hmm. I guess like looking at the work you do in terms of being on the ground with the smaller kind of communities and connecting with developers do you see the developers listening and if yeah and if is there a mechanism that that works well to get those people's voices heard or is it just people are just open-minded um so in my i'm not going to speak specifically only to, around the victoria yards scenario because since then i have been working in other situations but i think that Disappointingly, it is many times easier for develop for me to get a uh, audience with developers as a white male than and a cisgendered white male than um, it is for uh, people of color. Um, even if the people of color are directly affected um, by the development or otherwise, or even more knowledgeable than I am, and I think that that um, definitely is an ongoing issue in South Africa, and I'm sure globally where um, most of the developers and people that hold wealth are white men. And um, it's a kind of uh, a barrier to being able to, to allow developers to really do what they have possibility to do. So I, I think it's, it's again, it's, it's not about, you can't just allow it to be because of the goodness of someone's heart or otherwise it does, it does need to be enforced. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Um, Sam, son of a, of a back question of, um, from Leila and Harrison. As an individual, how do you see us as, a, as individuals empowering and um, being a catalyst for that transformation um, within kind of organisations and businesses? Um, this is going to sound like an extremely cop-out answer, but it really is about having the initiative to develop your own sense of self-awareness and self-confidence. The reality is, is that many engineers that we have working that leave engineers that board, you know, have their time with engineers that borders UK and go into industry, they will be working for quite conventional businesses that are profit bearing and have specific goals that aren't necessarily truly altruistic, even though, you know, uh, we won't touch on things like CSR or anything like that in this, in this session, obviously. But, and when you do find yourself in that, um, context where you are, in, you know, in, you are in a pos possession of being able to see that, you know, we could be driving this to a more um, positive place. Um, it, the reality is, is that, you know, you can be on the receiving end of quite a lot of criticism and a lot of um, knee jerk responses, you know, in the, and I'm talking about sort of in the day to day, you will have a conversation with a colleague and you will raise that, you know, or, or, or a quite a senior member of staff. Um, and you could say that, well, we could actually be doing this this way um, or we could be doing something this way. And actually that would make things a bit easier for the diversity that we have in our business, just to allude back to my pre previous example that I gave earlier on in this session. Um, 
And you have to be prepared that not everybody, whilst people may be willing to listen, and I suppose this is kind of twists back a little bit, they may not be willing to accept. And so there is a process involved in that when you are sharing something, an idea or a thought that it does goes against the grain or goes against the norm of the workplace that you're working in and you're striving to change that organization as, a, as an individual um there is a process that you need to go through uh, alongside your colleagues they they will initially address, uh, reject what you're saying or respond to it in a very specific way with their own assumptions and project onto you as an individual you know you will take criticisms as a, as a, as a person not just as a colleague as an engineer um but then, but then comes a process of acceptance um, because inevitably these things are ultimately bigger than us. Things like net zero is much bigger than any of us. Climate change is bigger than any of us. And so, I mean, it may make feel, somebody feel better in the short term to disagree with me. Um, the facts remain. And I think that there's a lot of comfort to be found in that as an individual, knowing that you are coming from as best as an informed place as you can be when you are trying to persuade and influence people. Yeah, I think that's that's that's, a, that's very interesting and thanks for sharing. I think um, just off the back of that, I guess my question to kind of Isabella is, you know, through the work that you've done and, you know, kind of your, your history of working in the engineering industry and supporting people, how important do you think like what is the main changes you see in people that are empowered at kind of a younger age where they enter in the industry to how they make it impact maybe in like five, I mean, I won't go any higher than five years, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you asked that because there was a, a question in the chat that piqued my interest as well from Millie about, um, yeah, if you're someone with limited influence or just starting out in your career, how do you kind of drive inclusivity in your workplace? Which I think mm-hmm. links nicely with what you've just asked. Um so yeah, there's a there's an answer about um, becoming a union rep. So that is a, an interesting approach, and yeah, definitely an option. Um, I think what I would advise young people, and you know, the, the thing that I love the most about the generation that I work with is they are so knowledgeable and so ethical and so driven by. Um, the right values and morals that they have an awful lot to bring to these conversations so as a starting point I'd flip it and say that we as more seasoned professionals or more mature professionals should absolutely use our positions to make sure that we're including young people in those conversations so as an example when uh, we started the Embrace uh, ERG here we made a point of making sure that we had a couple of apprentices in that group and that we then had some graduates uh, or some fresh uh, fresh blood into the company on that group. Um, so that, that I think is our responsibility to make sure we're including young people in those conversations. Um, and then using some of that information that I've just shared, you know, they, they need to know that, that their perspectives are valuable um, and they are the future of our companies, right? Be that our customers or our employees. Um, and so, yeah, use, use that information, know that you have that power to, to bring a, a youthful and future perspective to the conversation. So feel empowered to stick your hand up and go, I want to get involved in that. Because, um, yeah, if you're speaking to the right people, they should not be excluding you if you offer. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, and there's a question in the chat um, about ecosystems um, and creating, you know, business ecosystems. Um, I guess also probably link into the well-being economy. Um, I know Sam, you have a bit of like knowledge around like using um, supply chains to kind of inform decision making and create ecosystems. Do you see a way that we can have an inclusive supply chain to then create and go on to provide innovative, inclusive um, like solutions to to business needs? Um. So I think I should probably start from a more engineering standpoint with that question. Um, With things like net zero, we're very focused on the technologies that we want to produce and implement in order to be able to reach net zero. So we want carbon neutral technologies like renewables and things like that, so so to speak. Um, What's interesting is um, we think about obviously the, the generation and we think about the demand, but we forget the sort of the process in the middle the supply chain bit and that is not only is it important to be looking at what we're making it's also important to be looking at the way we're making it 
And if we don't look uh, from a more, in, again, from a bit, bit more of an engineering answer, if we don't look at decarbonising manufacturing processes, um, you know, it, 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 we're missing out sort of 50% of the com the whole point of needing to decarbonise effectively. Um, so from a, um, sorry, would you mind repeating the question again, just so I don't lose my point. <laughs> I've lost my point slightly, I'm really sorry. I, I don't know the question. Um, I think it was just basically how, to, how do you imb embed inclusivity into the ecosystem of a business like model um, mm. and drive that for innovation to produce like industry solutions? As, as simple as it sounds, be the gap spotter. Um, so if you are seeing areas where things haven't been considered, so say, for example, we're not focused enough on decarbonizing manufacturing, and that's become, again, become more of an emerging area, the more people have started to pipe up about it, and especially try to put forward evidence that, yes, this is genuinely a problem. Um, in terms of embedding it into the practice, it's obviously one thing trying to introduce it, it's another thing trying to maintain it. And I think this is where consistency is also, again, I think consistency is an established leadership uh, principle, but it is frequently sort of listed at the bottom of the list in terms of sort of leadership qualities that we talk about today still. Um, not, not as quite as far as empathy, perhaps, and so on and so forth, but the, the idea of consistency and kind of sticking to your guns a little bit, for lack of a less uh, glamorous way of putting it, is, is quite important. There's a lot of value in being tenacious and really believing in what you're trying to push. And that I think naturally motivates and inspires other people to believe in it as well. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Thank you um, for that, Sam. Um, I just wanna to come to you, Simon, in terms of um, looking at the business model and also what inspired you to get involved in this work and how that led you along a journey to, to where you are today. Um, okay, I mean, so in terms of the, the business model, um, the conventional business model, I think what I was recognizing that um, is that South Africa is kind of a microcosm of the globe in, in its levels of inequality and the trajectory that it's taken. Um, and along with growing inequality in South Africa, even though we've had political transformation and much greater inclusion politically, economic inclusion hasn't happened. Um, and we still see most uh, businesses being owned by white males, as I, as I mentioned earlier, and most shareholders um, the same. And, um, and so I was looking to other economic models um, and how to reduce inequality in a way that could happen democratically where wealthy people realize that actually it's for the better of, for, of them. Because in South Africa, as with most countries, um, We've seen increasing crime and violent crime, um, increasing discontent and unhappiness, um, increasing uh, spatial um, uh, dispersion, and um, even down to increasing bullying. And I, I think the two epidemiologists in the UK um, who have produced brilliant work, I'll drop it into the chat just now, I can't remember the names right now, Kate Pickett, uh, I think. Anyway, um, but, but just looking at inequality and rising social ills. And so I think in South Africa, it's, it's, it's also a democratic country. We're looking at how we can get people to get on board that are currently people that have the wealth and the power to, to and the decision-making power. Um, and a well-being economy really spoke to me because it, it sort of proves through various means how actually greater equality also means greater happiness for the wealthy and greater or more equal distribution of wealth is also better for the wealthy that would have to be part of that redistribution process. Um, and so that's what I was trying on a small scale um, in Johannesburg, um, but now I've, I've moved to Cape Town and I'm doing the same here. And um, yeah, we'll have to see where it goes. I just kind of get your final thoughts in terms of the word inclusivity. Um, what does that mean to you and how do you do that through the work you do? Um, so inclusivity happens on various planes and um, in South Africa, racial uh, lack of inclusion or exclusivity is usually linked also to economic 
exclusivity or lack of inclusivity. So, so I think, um, and in many ways, uh, disability or different ability, um, different gender, different sexuality, these are all things that um, often are planes for exclusion. I think the most important one that I see playing out in all of it is the economic exclusion because because um, that causes the most um, dis, uh, discontent and the most uh, strife for people across the spectrum um, of of income and wealth inequality, and so so that's kind of the one that I look to. And generally in South Africa, like I said, race also falls along. So poorer people are generally black, wealthy people are generally white, and that is often the case. I think that isn't the case in the UK as well. So I, I think that that would be the one that I hone in on. And um, by solving economic inequality, one will likely find that the other um, spaces where exclusion occurs become less, uh, less, less harsh or less, less um, extreme. Okay, oh, great. Thank you so much for sharing. That was very insightful. Um, uh, Isabella, I guess just in terms of a little bit what Simon has just said, um, inclusion is less understood, but exclusion is very well understood. What are your kind of thoughts on that? And how do you um, ensure that people aren't excluded in, in the work that you do? Yes, I think the starting point um, for me is it, is it comes back to that vulnerability thing. Um, we have to self-reflect, right? And we have to look at ourselves. And if ever we have knowingly excluded someone, why did we do that? Um, is it because we don't understand enough about those people or about their lived experiences? Um, and then the most important bit, once you've done that self-reflection, is the responsibility piece. You know, own it. This is not this is not something that other people fix. We all fix it. Every single one of us has a place and a part to play in this. So if, for example, you do recognize something that you've done previously to exclude somebody or knowingly or unknowingly, go and learn about it. Learn about those people's lived experiences and then use that knowledge to become an active ally. Um, you know, speak up when you see injustices happening, um, stick up for people that are, are, are left out of the conversation, even when they're in the room. Those are things that we can all do. And it's tough, you know, it's tough to look at yourself and go, okay, that's a bad bit of my personality. But actually the self-reflection leads to personal growth um, for yourself and for the people that you're then bringing into the conversation as well. So for me, that, that would be my kind of key bit of advice is um, it starts with all of us and we have to look at ourselves and our own behaviours and how we can make that our workplace more inclusive for other people. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, and Sam, I guess also a similar question to you. What does inclusion mean to you and how do you do it through the work that you do? Inclusivity means to me, um, so through my work with Sheffield Women in Technology, I'm essentially a British Asian engineering professional who falls under a certain socioeconomic grouping. And I'm working to uplift um, women from a certain background who are the majority white and um, again of a certain socioeconomic grouping which may in many ways sound counterintuitive in certain contexts but that's what inclusivity looks like you have people lifting each other up if they are in a position it's about privilege and it's about accountability and I have a certain level of privilege and I am able to take a certain amount of accountability because of that privilege and so it's about uh, lifting I think the f I hate to use the buzz phrase lifting as you climb <laughs> um, but it really is about lifting as you climb uh, climb and sometimes that does look like you know white uh, you know non-optical white allyship uh, in, in in the light of what's happened with BLM and sometimes it looks like something a bit more nuanced such as what I'm doing at the moment um, another thing is is as an engineer um, working with data sets so that I know that I'm designing a product or a service that isn't going to harm certain groups because they've not been considered in, and included in the process. Um, I'd really like to share a link with um, everyone. It's from the Institute of Ergonomics. It's called the Design for Everyone Project and they're inviting all members of the general public to send us to share in their physical measurements, if you feel comfortable with that, to start building more inclusive data sets so that we can start genuinely designing for everyone. Um, my last point is, um, I think that's it. I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> 
I think that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that, Sam. Um, and maybe you can share the link also in the chat if possible. Um, sure. Just get yeah, to go over there. So perfect. So that's the end of our kind of panel session for now as we go to the breakout room. So I just want to thank the panelists um, for sharing their insights and. I learned a lot and um, I hope you guys did too. Um, so yeah, we're going into our breakout rooms now. Um, you're gonna be put in a breakout room. And what we want you to do is build on that concept of allyship. So as individuals, what can we do to be allies to other people? So you know, we think about diverse groups and people that are often excluded. Um, you know, I'm a black female, but maybe I need to think about how, how I can support and be an ally to people that have a disability or people that are from a different um, underrepresented group um, and think about what actions you can do. So what can you do to embed inclusivity into your day to day practice and what actions can you take within your own influence that supports yourself um, or others to become an ally? So go into your breakout rooms, discuss it. And um, when we come back, if we can pop your insights into the chat. So have a little think during the discussions. And remember when we get back, I would like to hear them. So I think we'll be put into uh, breakout rooms now. Welcome back. So I would love to hear some thoughts. So you can pop it in the chat if you're feeling brave, maybe put some hands up and I can come to you if you want to share. We haven't got a lot of time, so you've got about 30-ish seconds if you do want to say anything. I'd love to hear some thoughts. Can you put your hand up? Okay, yes, I have Stephen. Go Stephen. Hi Stephen. Hi everyone. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier in the chat is um, in my workplace, I'm a union rep, um, and that can be a way of um, not only being able to escalate issues, but also hearing issues from other members of staff. Uh, particularly even if you're earlier on in your career, I'm sort of early midish career at this point. Um, but also, um, there was an example uh, we were discussing in our breakout room about inclusivity um, in uh, where I work, in my workplace, um, we'd actually had a few um, job vacancies uh, when it comes to making um, heat shielding blankets for spacecraft. And we had actually had uh, quite an issue recruiting for those posts. Um, and there's a bit of a return to the drawing board and looking at the language used in the job description. And it was very sciencey, very technical, very sort of uh, this is going on spacecraft and things like that. When they redid the wording and put the job vacancies out again, they used much more, they talked much more about the role and the skills required. And uh, I've just had a quick look and I found a web page which sort of explains it. So I'll pop that in the chat and people can have a read of it. But, Perfect. Yeah, Thank say. you so much for sharing, Stephen. Um, and yeah, pop it in the chat. I'd love to share. Um, great. Anybody else have any uh, thoughts they would like to uh, share? Oh, pop it in the chat. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to pick on Sam just because I can. <laughs> I've spoken enough for, uh, for one evening. Um, so we ended up touching on some key points about uh understanding that um processes need to be inclusive not just the things that we do um and kind of leading on a point i think a point that i made to, when we were on the panel discussion that um that the processes need to be inclusive of everybody everybody needs to be able to use a process in order to be able to do something it's not just about um developing a process and expecting everybody to be able to implement it and get the same result uh so that was something again it, a lot of engineering and industry is about having the right process to hand we don't necessarily always have them sometimes we have to make it up as we go along um not to scare anybody but um but yeah understanding that there are different ways of, of developing and implementing a process that works for everyone um and that everyone can use it um uh, whether that's a simple process of how you give feedback within an organization how you are able to access training events 
um, and so on and so forth. Uh, another point that was raised um, was around sort of uh, essentially building on sort of the fact that at the minute, you, you know, through things like the Design for Engineering Challenge within the university education sector, um, some people have access to kind of being able to develop their skills ahead of joining industry um, but maybe some people aren't being as engaged at the minute and that's you know down to obviously limited scope at the moment and the fact that academia is slow moving to engage with the level of changes that are needed to be able to match industry so we're closing so that we can close that gap um, but then I think in some ways, again, it's perhaps a kind of a balance between disruptive, which is a fact, you know, disruptive innovation, which is a fast moving thing and incremental innovation, which is a slow moving thing. And that is sometimes it's important to have a parameter that is slow moving so that you don't just see what, what goes on from A to Z or A from A to K to J to Z or whatever. Um, but you are sort of seeing all of the details of how change really happens. And that is in itself an opportunity to be able to pick up on what you may may or may not have missed. Um, so I think, I think those are the key points. Great. Thank, thanks so much, Sam. And thank you all for being here today. Thank you all for engaging, sharing your thoughts and being part of um, this movement to be towards being more globally responsible engineers. Um, and people in engineering. So it's gonna be a feedback poll, which I think is gonna pop up. Um, so it'd be great if you could kind of just answer the questions. Um, I don't know when it's gonna pop up, but it will pop up, I think. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, if you could just answer that, it'll be perfect. Um, and that's just to kind of help us and go more. Um, with inclusion, it's a continuous cycle. I don't think the job is ever done. Um, you know, it's something that we continuously do. The more you know, the better you can be. No one knows everything. Um, and no one's gonna get it right every single time, but it's the importance to make space for growth, to develop and to further understand how we can support people not just ourselves, but outside of ourselves, outside of our circle influence, and sometimes even outside of our, our knowledge base. So looking at how something, you know, a product developed in this country is then going to go through the cycle and end up on the other side of the world. How can we ensure that that life cycle of that product supports the people and is inclusive along the way? Um, and yeah, it's important you know, as part of your pledge towards global responsibility and, you know, being a member of Engineers Without Borders, um, we want to reach the tipping point where global responsibility becomes integral to the way all engineering is taught, practiced, and that's not going to be an easy job. But through the power of movement and the, everything that we're doing and creating these spaces, creating change makers and people that are empowered, we can start to turn the dial. It's the decade no was it year decade of action so what is your action how can you be um part of that change part of that cycle um and together with the members within this conversation the wider engineers that board with members um we all want to put global responsibility at the heart of engineering to ensure that it's a safe and just future for us all. So the conversation doesn't stop here. Um, you can move over to the movement on Slack to continue the conversation. Um, the next panel is regenerative, regenerative, and that is on the 17th of November at half six. So again, just want to thank you all for being here um, and contributing and being in part of making an inclusive future. So I hope you have a lovely evening and yeah, thank you everybody for being here today. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.